So today I'm going to talk about what was promised in the abstract. And many of you have, uh, or maybe some of you have seen me talk about these things before. Uh, so I'll try to tell you some new aspects, at least. OK, so the first thing is stability in optimization problems. Um, so as you may know, uh, an optimization problem is called stable if any near optimum is close to a global optimum in the appropriate metric. Okay, so if you take any near optimal point, it's close to the, it must be close to the global optimum. So a very toy example uh, is the following. You take x squared. So this is minimized as 0, and this is stable. Any near minimal point must also be close to 0. Okay? But on the other hand, if you take this function, x squared e to the minus x squared, so it's like a parabola near 0, and then it decays far away, uh, then it's minimized at 0 uniquely, but there are points arbitrarily far away that are as close to being minimum as you want. So this is a bit unstable. So if you perturb the function a little bit, then you have a minimum at, at some very uh, distant point. Okay. Um, so in mathematics, you have lots and lots of stability theorems, and many of them are quite hard. Um, in probability theory, uh, so in mathematics, usually there is a single optimization problem. In probability theory, there is always an n going to infinity. So we are obsessed with n going to infinity. Um, so, uh, so David Aldous introduced the notion of stability that he called asymptotic essential uniqueness, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, there is a famous result of Aldous which says that the random assignment problem has this property. OK, so what is this problem? You have an n by n table of IID non-negative random variables with mean 1. And the objective is to minimize this cost, summation ci pi i over all permutations pi of 1 to n. OK? So this is interpreted, cij is interpreted as the cost of allocating task i to agent j. So there are n tasks and n agents. And you have to distribute the uh, tasks so that you can do it in minimum cost. So under very mild conditions, Aldous proved uh, Paris's conjecture that uh, this minimum uh, converges to pi squared over 6 um, as n tends to infinity. So that's a, a famous result of Aldous. And in the same paper, he also proved um, that under, again, mild conditions on these matrix entries, the minimizing permutation has this asymptotic essential uniqueness property in the sense that when n is large, any permutation that nearly minimizes the cost must be close to the global minimizer. Okay. So that's a, that's a very hard result, actually, to prove this. And later on, you know, he proved uh, things which are simpler than this, which is uh, uh, in, you know, in the minimum spanning tree on a lattice, uh, you have the same property, that any near minimum um, spanning tree uh, is, is close to uh, the actual minimum in various senses. Um, so, so this is non-trivial, but let's see a very trivial example, a very simple example of uh, asymptotic essential uniqueness. Suppose you have G1 to Gn IID random variables with some continuous density, for instance, Gaussian. And then you maximize summation Gi sigma i over all sigma 1 to sigma n, which are plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So this is an absolutely trivial problem, and the maximum is attained when sigma i is the sign of gi. Okay, so you, you just take sigma i to, the, to be the sign of gi, which gives you summation absolute value gi, and that's obviously the maximum that this can be. Um, moreover, this has the uniqueness property, the essential uniqueness property. That is, any uh, configuration, sigma 1 to sigma n, which nearly minim maximizes this, must be close to the actual maximum. And that's because of this very simple representation. The sum is summation absolute gi minus twice summation absolute gi over all i, where it's different from this optimum configuration. Okay? So if, if there is a substantial number of these, then this will be pretty large. You can easily prove that. Okay, so this is a simple example where you have an optimization problem, a random optimization problem, a very trivial random optimization problem, and the maximizer is essentially unique, okay? When n is large. Any questions? Okay, so what I'll be interested in this talk, one of the things I'll be interested in is the opposite of this. So, so what happens if we replace the linear form by a quadratic form and try to maximize this, where these are again IID random variables? Now, does this property still hold? 
Okay? So the, in the linear form, we saw that the maximizer is essentially unique. Does it hold in the quadratic form? So the guess is no. Okay? And there is a very simple reason why you can say no. Suppose this vector was allowed to take values on a sphere instead of the hypercube. Okay? So these are plus minus one, but instead of that, you, t you let it uh, vary on a sphere. Then this problem is exactly the problem of finding the largest eigenvalue. So assume that the matrix is symmetric. Okay. And we know that for symmetric matrices with IID entries under mild conditions, the large eigenvalues cluster. So under proper normalization, the largest eigenvalue converges to two, the second largest, third largest, all converge to two. Okay. And therefore, um, these eigenvectors corresponding to these are all near optimal solu solutions. Okay. The, the large eigenvectors are all near optimal. They're mutually orthogonal to each other. Okay. So, so the essential uniqueness doesn't hold in this problem. But uh, you see, this is not, not a very easy theorem that these large eigenvalues are all converging to the same value up there. Okay? At least it's not in that, like in the previous problem. It's not trivial like that. Um, however, if you go down to this problem where you have plus minus one, uh, none of these random matrix tools are available and you, you know, um, it's not clear how to prove this no uniqueness result. Okay, so this is one problem. You can think of various other random optimization problems. So one problem where it's not even clear what should be the case is the traveling salesman. Uh, you know, people think it's, it should be unique. So you have the traveling sales, Euclidean traveling salesman and uh, NIID points, and you try to find the length minimizing path through these points. And whether any near minimum path is close to the actual minimum, it's not clear. Uh, but people think that's uh, true, I, I think, but it's not. The, I don't think there's a definite conjecture about that. Okay, so, so one of uh, the motivations for this study is to, is to understand this lack of uniqueness and why and in what circumstances you can prove such a thing. Okay, any questions? Okay, um, so the motivation for, one motivation for studying this quadratic form is that it occurs as a multiple of this uh, energy of a spin configuration in this uh, model called the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model of spin glasses. Uh, so lots of people have worked on this. Um, Telegram has two volumes, uh, 1600 pages of, uh, you know, if you want to look at it. Um, so, and that's mostly his own theorems. Um, so, okay, so uh, to be, to, to be completely precise, uh, the model is defined as follows. Um, let GIJ be IID standard normal random variables. So we, we take standard Gaussian. And for any spin co configuration, the energy of uh, sigma is defined as minus one over root n times summation GIJ sigma I sigma J. Okay, so this, there's this factor of one over root n. And the physicists have claimed that this energy landscape of this model has this, these things called multiple values, which is a very complicated notion. Somehow what the physicists mean is a, is a very complicated notion. And it's not even actually clear what, uh, what this means. So you can look at this, uh, uh, this book of uh, Mezart, Perisi, and uh, Virasoro. They talk about this, but uh, you know, it's, not, it's not really clear, uh, at least to me. I mean, maybe. So, um, but a very simple interpretation, so nothing to do with the actual meaning of multiple values. A very simplistic interpretation is that there are many spin configurations with near minimal energy that are all nearly orthogonal to each other. Okay, just as I mentioned in the previous slide, that can you at least prove this? Okay, so the physicists actually talk about Gibbs measures and the support of Gibbs measures and the structure of Gibbs measures, but in a very simple um, interpretation, can you at least prove that there are many configurations with nearly minimum energy, which means that the nearly maximize this, and they're all almost orthogonal to each other? Okay. Okay, so let me try to give uh, a sort of a precise definition of multiple values in the random setting. Um, so, so one can define it in this way. Suppose you have a sequence of sets, Xn, and suppose for each n there is a similarity measure on xn, which is sn xy denotes the degree of similarity between two elements x and y. 
Okay, I, I don't I don't want to go through metrics, so I just want similarities. Uh, so no no particular property you assume except measurability. Um, and it's non-negative, and if it's close to zero, then x and y are very dissimilar. If it's larger, then they become more and more similar. And fn is a random function. So we say that this triple, fn, xn, and sn, it exhibits multiple values if the following happens. If there exists sequences epsilon n, delta n, and gamma n tending to zero, and k n tending to infinity, such that with probability one minus gamma n, that is high probability, there is a subset of this set of size bigger than k n, so there is a large subset. Okay, with high probability, there is a large subset such that uh, for any two elements of this set, distinct elements, they are very dissimilar, so they have small similarity, and they're all near minimal. Okay, so so this is you know one one way that one can possibly define uh, these multiple values. So uh, with high probability, there is a large uh, set of points so that any two of these points are very dissimilar and uh, they are all nearly minimum okay for this function okay okay any questions about this definition so you won't have to you know remember this definition very much in this talk so it's uh, it's not a mental burden to, to remember this okay so in the sherrington kirkpatrick model, you have that the uh, space is uh, the hypercube. The similarity measure, one way to define it is uh, the normalized inner product squared, okay? So if this is zero, then these are orthogonal configurations, and this can range between zero and one, the similarity between sigma one and sigma two, two configurations. And you have these IID standard normal variables, and you have this energy function, which is what I just defined, the energy. And this is a theorem that I proved in 2009, is that the sequence exhibits multiple values. That, um, so in other words, uh, with high probability, if n is large, with high probability there is a large number of points in the space that are nearly orthogonal to each other where hn is near mil minimal. Okay. Okay, so through this example, I will try to demonstrate um, how such a theorem may be proven. So there may be other ways to prove it, but I don't know. Um, so how, how such a theorem may be proven, and uh, you know, in a general picture, not in a very specific uh, problem. So, so I'll talk about other, some other problems if I have time. Any questions about this slide? Okay. So you have this quadratic form. And you're saying that on this space, this random quadratic form is nearly minimized on a large number of points which are nearly orthogonal to each other. Okay. Um, so this random matrix example, somehow, even in the random matrix setting, I don't know of an easy way to just to prove this. Um, so I don't know that. Uh, so I'll, I'll outline a general uh, plan. So the first step will be to prove what I call super concentration of a of a random quantity. So roughly this will mean, so I'll, I'll tell you what this means. Super concentration means that the quantity has smaller fluctuations than predicted by classical theory, okay? So, you know, uh, pr uh, probabilists are always trying to compute expectations and, uh, you know, bound variances. So this bounding variances thing, there is a large classical theory, bounding variances and, uh, you know, more sophisticated tail bounds, that's concentration of measure. Um, so. So when so I, I say that something is super concentrated roughly if it has smaller fluctuations than predicted by, by this classical theory. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a more precise definition. The next step is to show that this notion, this small fluctuations of some relevant quantity, is equivalent to chaos in a certain sense, and chaos in a system is you know high sensitivity to small perturbations. Okay, so in the case of this energy landscape of the SK model, it'll mean that if you perturb the system a little bit in a certain way, then the, the, the minimum energy state will jump to something very different. Okay, so that's chaotic behavior. So I'll connect this small variance with this large sensitivity to perturbations. And uh, lastly, uh, I will deduce multiple values from chaos. Okay. Okay, any questions? So this, uh, this route to prove super, uh, super concentration and then chaos and then multiple valleys, um, 
this can be used to establish this multiple valley property in a, uh, in a variety of problems, but you know, we'll, we'll stick to this one example, just working, working this out, okay. Okay, uh, here are some references. Uh, this is based you know, primarily on ideas from these two uh, papers that I have, uh, chaos concentration multiple valleys uh, and uh, this, this one. And, but the proofs I will show today uh, is you know, different and you know, I could see through various things in the, uh, in the years that went by after this, writing these papers, so hopefully it will be more enlightening. Okay. okay, so let me start the discussion about how to prove this. So we start with a Markov process, continuous time Markov process on some state space. Okay, suppose there exists an invariant measure for this process uh, such that irrespective of where you start, the limiting distribution converges to mu, okay? So in other words, this is sometimes called the equilibrium measure. So uh, you start from any state, wherever you start, eventually the measure is going to be mu. It'll, it's, so under mild conditions, um, there, so there is an invariant, pro, pro, so the important thing is, is it's a probability measure. So for instance, random walk on the lattice won't have such an invariant measure. Um, okay. So this Markov process naturally defines a semigroup, PT, so that's a Markov semigroup, uh, which is PTF at X is the expected value of FXT given X0 equals X. Okay, so that's a Markov semigroup defined by this process. So it's a semigroup of operators. It's a semigroup because PT plus S is PT times PS. Okay, so that's, that's why it's called a semigroup. And any such Markov process will define a semigroup of operators. And by this assumption, you know that this uh, PTF, these functions converge pointwise to a constant, uh, which is the expected value of F under mu. Okay, so that's one little observation as a consequence of our assumptions, we have this. Okay. Okay, so you have a Markov process and we have a semigroup. Uh, the generator of a Markov semigroup is defined as LF as the derivative of PT at zero. So it's PTF minus F divided by T as T goes to zero. So, you know, there are various issues of when is this well defined and so on, I'll not go into all that. Um, none of the groups that, uh, semi-groups that I will discuss uh, you know, will have any issues with making things rigorous. So, uh, so, you know, this is the definition of the generator of the process. I suppose most of you know these. Uh, heat equation, so it's, uh, you, you try to take derivative of PT with respect to T, so you have this. Now by the semi-group property you can decompose uh, PT plus S is PS times PT, so this is the identity operator. Now PS minus identity over S converges to L, so you have LPT. So the derivative of PT with respect to T is L times PT. So that's, uh, that's the heat equation for, uh, for a Markov semigroup, okay? And this equation, you know, formally, this implies that PT is E to the TL because you know, take derivative and L comes out, which indicates this PT is e to the TL, and you can prove this rigorously. So this is a series, uh, you know, series sum. In various circumstances, you can prove this rigorously. Okay, um, a more you know, notation. This equilibrium measure that you have for the Markov chain, um, Markov process, defines a natural inner product on L2 mu as just the expected value of fg under mu, integral fg d mu. Okay, so that's the, that's the natural linear product on L, L2 mu. The Dirichlet form uh, is just this. You take two functions f and g, e fg is the expected value of f times lg, so it's negative of the inner product of f and lg. So that's the, that's the Dirichlet form of a Markov chain, or a Markov process, okay? And the process is said to be reversible if L is self-adjoint with respect to this inner product. So you can bring L to F, so if it, F L G is L F G, so that is, if and only if the Dirichlet form is a symmetric form. So, um, so that's, that's a reversible chain. Okay. Um, 
Given two functions, the covariance, as you all know, is defined as um, the expected value of fg minus expected f, expected g. So that's the covariance, and the variance is defined as the covariance of f with f. Okay. And a Markov process xt is said to satisfy a Poincare inequality with constant c if for all f in L2 mu, you have that the variance of f is bounded by c times the Dirichlet form of f with f. Okay, so that's a Poincare inequality. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so the question, one question that arises is when does a Markov process satisfy a Poincare inequality? So do, we'll answer this question shortly. So let L be the generator of a reversible Markov semigroup. We already know that L is a self-adjoint operator by the definition of reversibility. And we'll prove that this is negative semi-definite, or at least sketch a proof. So by Jensen's inequality, we know that this is an L2 contraction. So PTF is a conditional expectation. So the L2 norm of PTF must be less than the L2 norm of the original thing by Jensen's inequality. So it's a contraction. So therefore, by cauchy schwartz you have that F PTF in a product is um, bounded by the L2 norm of F times L2 norm of PTF, which is bounded by the L2 norm of F squared, so FF. And since LF is this, this shows that FLF is always uh, non-positive. Okay? So this is a negative semi-definite form. And, um, and moreover, for any constant function f, uh, you have that this is identically zero from this formula. You say that. So zero is an eigen, always an eigenvalue, so it's never negative definite. And since pt is e to the tl and ptf we know is converges to a constant, this, you know, can combine this to prove that constant functions are the only functions that satisfy this. Okay. So no other function will satisfy this under everything under mild conditions that allow you to uh, do all that you want, exchange derivatives and integrals and so on. Again, under some conditions, uh, you can, you know, uh, the eigenvalues of minus L, these are, you know, they're all non-negative, can be ordered as a countable sequence. Lambda zero must be zero, less than lambda one, less than lambda two, and so on. If lambda one is positive, we say that this Markov process has a spectral gap. So that's lambda one. Okay, so you have this generator, you have its eigenvalue starting from zero and going up. If the first eigenvalue is positive, that is zero has multiplicity one, uh, then you have a spectral gap. And let this be I, you know, mutually orthogonal eigenvectors, so u zero is a constant function. Since um, you know, this LF is zero only for F constant, so this can be used to prove that this is a, an orthogonal basis. So it's not only a sequence of orthogonal eigenfunctions, uh, you know, it's a basis of L2. It's a complete uh, uh, collection. So therefore, any F may be written like this as a linear combination of these eigenfunctions, UKF times UK. And consequently, this uh, Dirichlet form has its expression, summation lambda k, u, k, f, u, k, g. Okay, so these are all basics of Markov processes and semigroups and generators. Any questions? Okay. Um, so here's a little fact which answers the question that we raised. A Markov process satisfies a Poincare inequality if and only if it has a spectral gap. Moreover, this optimal constant is one over the spectral gap. Okay. So we'll prove this in the slide. So this is an orthogonal basis of L2. So you have the Plancherel identity. The L2 norm squared is just the norm squared of these uh, Fourier coefficients. And uh, the first Fourier coefficient U0 F is just the expectation because U0 is identically one. So you can move this to this side and you get that the variance, it's an alternative form of the Plancherel identity. The variance is just this sum except that you sum from one to infinity instead of zero to infinity. Okay, so that's the variance. So if lambda one is positive, you can upper bound this by lambda one over lambda, lambda k over lambda one because lambda k over lambda one is always bigger than or equal to one. These are increasing sequence of eigenfunctions, eigenvalues. Uh, and this thing is precisely you know, the Dirichlet form as we discussed in the last slide. So you have this, okay? And moreover, equality is achieved if you take F equals U1. 
the first eigenvector. Okay. So these are all, again, very simple facts. The Poincare inequality may seem like a strange thing when you look at it, but if you look at the Fourier uh, expansion in this basis, it's, uh, it's a trivial uh, result, okay, if lambda one is positive. Any questions? Okay, so I hope I've kept things simple enough so that everyone is on board. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if lambda one is zero, then the function u one violates the Poincare inequality because it's a non-constant function, does non-zero variance, but you know, so so your lambda one has to be positive. Okay, so an example. So I, I've described everything in, in abstract terms. So a concrete example. Uh, the standard ornstein uhlenbeck process, XT, on the real line is a Markov process that satisfies the stochastic differential equation. Okay, now, uh, even if you're unfamiliar with stochastic calculus, you, don't, you shouldn't worry, because this has an alternate description as this, okay, as a time-changed Brownian motion, time-changed and scaled Brownian motion. So this is more natural, this is something a little weird, but uh, if you don't know stochastic calculus, then this is uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you have standard Brownian motion, you, you do a time change and then you scale it down and then this you know, satisfies this, uh, this decomposition. So this is actually a scaling limit uh, of, um, of autoregressive processes if you know what, what it is, okay? Um, this alternative representation tells you what is the distribution of xt. So given x0 equals x, you can use this alternative representation of the Ornstein-Lundbeck process to say that the distribution of xt is the same as this, where z is a standard normal random variable. And therefore the Markov semigroup has this explicit expression, ptf at x is this, expected value of f e to the minus t x plus square root one minus e to the minus two t times z, where z is normal zero one. And this shows by taking t to infinity Okay, this part goes away, this part becomes one. So the standard Gaussian measure, gamma, is the equilibrium measure for PT. Okay, an orange to Lundbeck process and limit has a standard normal distribution. Okay, any questions? So let's see what, what have we done. Uh, we have defined Markov semigroups, we have defined generators and so on, uh, Dirichlet forms. Now we are doing a specific example of a Markov process, which is the ornstein uhlenbeck process, uh, which has stationary distribution normal zero one. Okay. Now, multidimensional ornstein uhlenbeck process, an n-dimensional process is just, you know, n coordinates each flowing like an one-dimensional process, so it's very simple. So you have n coordinates and each of them is flowing like an ornstein uhlenbeck process and they're all independent. And the semigroup is simply, oh, sorry, there is an f here missing. So uh, expected value of f e to the minus tx plus this, where z is now an n-dimensional independent stand, uh, you know, standard Gaussian random vector, whose law we denote by gamma n. Okay, so there's an f here. And the generator of this process, okay, I'll not show you the computation, but you can compute the generator using this, uh, you know, form with this typo. Um, uh, so using this, uh, taking derivative at, with respect to t at zero and using integration by parts and all that, you can prove that the generator is this, LF is a Laplacian F minus X inner product with the gradient of F, okay? So that's the generator, that's a very well-known uh, you know, operator. Now, what about eigenfunctions and eigenvalues? The eigenfunctions of this process, okay, this, uh, you know, some of you may, may not know, um, the, uh, the, the eigenfunctions of this process are indexed by elements of z plus to the n. So z plus is a set of non-negative integers. So these are indexed by uh, n tuples of non-negative integers. And given such an n-tuple, the eigenfunction hk is simply the product of hki xi. So x is x1 to xn. So hk of x1 to xn is product hki xi, where hki is a ki univariate Hermit polynomial. And the eigenvalue corresponding to this eigenfunction is k1 plus up to kn. Okay? 
So that's the, that's the spectral decomposition of uh, this Ornstein Uhlenbeck generator. And consequently, you see these eigenvalues, it's, this is a spectral gap one, okay? Zero is, is, has multiplicity one, and then the next one is one. So this, this process has spectral gap one. And again, the Dirichlet form you can also compute, it's not hard. It's just the expected value of the inner product of gradient F and gradient G. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, Dirichlet form. So what the Poincaré inequality now tells us is that the variance of F under the standard Gaussian measure on Rn is bounded by the expected value of the gradient F norm squared, which is a non-trivial result. So we, we did a series of very simple steps and uh, you know, you know, verifying these, this is you know, slightly messy, but verifying that this is the case, that these are the eigenfunctions, it's also simple. Uh, this is a complete orthonormal system that's also quite easy to check. So it's all a sequence of simple steps which uh, lead to something uh, not very uh, you know, simple. This, uh, the, the Gaussian Poincaré inequality is a powerful tool and it can be refined to give the Gaussian concentration inequality uh, which is an even more powerful tool. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, Okay, so let's go back to the sherrington kirkpatrick model. So we have discussed these uh, Markov semigroups, we have discussed the ornstein lundbeck semigroup, and now we want to go back to this um, sherrington kirkpatrick model. So recall that we have this Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, just minus one over root n, the quadratic form, normal zero one random variables. It defines a Gibbs measure at inverse temperature beta uh, as follows, just as in all models of statistical mechanics, uh, you have that it defines a Gibbs measure on this space is a probability measure with density proportional to e to the minus beta hn, okay? And this is a normalizing constant, so that this sums to one. But that's the, that's the Gibbs measure defined by the sherrington kirkpatrick model of spin glasses. And this whole literature on this is trying to understand this measure. Okay, uh, more definitions. The free energy is defined as the log of the of this normalizing constant divided by beta. That's the free energy of the model. And the overlap between two configurations drawn independently from this Gibbs measure at inverse temperature beta, the overlap is just the normalized inner product. Okay. Any questions? Okay, uh, okay so now we come to one problem which is what is, the, what is the order of fluctuations of this free energy? So you have this normalizing constant, log of the normalizing constant, and what is the order of fluctuations of that? It is conjectured, it's not proven, it's conjectured that the variance is actually bounded by just some constant depending on beta, nothing depending on n. Okay, so I haven't seen it written down, but uh, you know, I had it to, told to me that, uh, you know, uh, the variance is must be bounded by um, some constant depending on beta, and this is an open question. Um, Eisenman, Leboitz, and Ruel prove this when beta is strictly less than one in this model that I just defined. The variance of the free energy. Now, the Poincaré inequality, if you apply this, it's not difficult to show using the Poincaré inequality, the variance is bounded by n some constant depending on beta times n, okay? So if you do the computation and you carry out the steps, and this is essentially the best that you can get um, by the Poincaré inequality and beta is bigger than one. When beta is bigger than one, um, you cannot get anything better using the Poincaré inequality, even if you are you know, very careful with everything. Uh, this is the best that you can get. And, um, and this was the best known upper bound. So I proved that, um, for any beta, the variance of the free energy is bounded by n over log n. So a slight improvement to, to the existing bound. Okay. So we'll see how to prove this, how to prove such a result. That you have the Poincaré inequality which tells you it's bounded by n and uh, the variance is bounded by n and then you can refine it to get exponential tail bounds and everything, all of which decay like square root n. Okay, so the, it gives fluctuations of order square root n. But trying to improve that, trying to get something a little better, than that, okay? 
Okay, so this is somehow the key to proving this multiple values that I was trying to prove, that this, this, this variance is smaller. It, you know, log n is not important, just a little bit better than n, just a little bit better than the classical bound will give you this chaotic phenomena and multiple values. Okay, so that's the main import of what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, so super concentration. Suppose you have a Markov process with equilibrium measure mu and Dirichlet form E and that satisfies a Poincare inequality with optimal constant C. We say that a function F is epsilon super concentrated if the variance of F is bounded by, instead of C times the Dirichlet form as given by the Poincare inequality, is bounded by C times epsilon times the Dirichlet form. So this is specific to the function, okay? Not all functions may be super concentrated. And epsilon super concentration with small epsilon means that the Poincare inequality is suboptimal for the variance bound for f. Okay, it's a property of this whole Markov semigroup plus this function f. Okay, so the general theory that you have, general concentration of measure, tries to give you bounds that hold for all f. Now I'm specifying, I'm coming down to certain f. Okay. So let lambda zero, lambda one, et cetera, be the eigenvalues of the generator of our process or the negative of the generator with eigenfunctions u zero, u one, et cetera. You assume your spectral gap. Um, okay, this is just one note that I uh, you know, might say here, but it may be confusing. Um, that the variance of f by the Plancherel formula is this, summation of the Fourier coefficient squared, and the Dirichlet form is this, where you just have the same thing but multiplied by the eigenvalues uh, and this being much less than this implies that super concentration occurs even only if most of this Fourier mass concentrates on the higher end of the spectrum. So this, you know, people who are familiar with noise sensitivity will immediately, you know, know what I'm talking about and other people may not. So uh, it doesn't help much. So, um, okay. Okay, so to prove super concentration in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick models. So let me first say super concentration, uh, okay, so uh, was, was proved uh, in some context before, for most notably in first passage percolation. It was proved by Benjamin Nicolai and Schramm in 2003 um, in, a, in a breakthrough paper that, uh, you know, I don't have time to talk about that today, uh, that they improved the variance bound for first passage percolation. Uh, and most of the work that has been done is using um, hypercontractive tools, but hypercontractivity doesn't seem to work in spin glasses, and you know it really doesn't work uh, somehow for certain reasons. Um, so we need different techniques, and the technique I'm going to describe today is, is something very simple, uh, and it's much simpler than what I actually have in my in my papers. But um, okay, so this this is the technique essentially. Okay, so an improved Poincaré inequality. So you take any f and take any m. The variance of f is bounded by the sum of squares of the Fourier coefficients from one to m minus one, plus the Dirichlet form divided by lambda m. Okay, so it's a very simple inequality. With lambda, with m equals one, you get your usual Poincare inequality. And with m equals infinity, you get the Plancherel identity. So it somehow interpolates between the Plancherel identity for the variance and the Poincare inequality bound. And the proof is simple. You note that the Dirichlet form is this, and the variance according to the Plancherel identity may be decomposed as sum from one to m minus one and m to infinity. And the m to infinity part may be bounded by lambda k over lambda m because these are increasing. And this sum is of course bounded by the Dirichlet, the Dirichlet form, so you get this, okay? Okay, so why is this useful? The way to use this is to get crude bounds on these Fourier coefficients. Now these crude bounds may be good if k is small, but become worse and worse as k grows and become useless after a while, okay? So, however, you can use this always to optimize over m. So with m equals one, you get your Poincare inequality, but you can, you can try to optimize. You can go up to some m for which these, these bounds are good, okay, are useful, and then you don't go any further. And by that time, this has become large, so this thing has become much smaller than the Dirichlet form. Okay, so it's a simple idea, this one. And surprisingly, you can use this. Okay, so any questions about this slide? Okay.
Okay, so, th so the main step is to somehow replace this by this Dirichlet form. So, you know, uh, these bounds are becoming bad, but you can, uh, you can replace the tail term by something nice. Okay, so this, this directly gives a super concentration for the free energy, not with the optimal thing. Um, so you use the Hermit polynomial basis of n choose two-dimensional uh, standard Gaussian measure, and then you compute these Fourier coefficients for the free energy, which are extremely complicated things, but you can get crude bounds. And the crude bounds are bad bounds, but you know, they're they are okay if case, you, you know, the eigenvalues are relatively small. So you can go up to a little bit. You can go up to eigenvalues like log n over log log n. You can go up to that. And then you use uh, this improved Poincare inequality and you get this bound. So it's a slight improvement over n. Okay, so I'll not, obviously I'll not go into the computations, but, um, but you, can, you can do this. So whenever you have a smooth function, this sort of thing will not work for, you know, for instance, last passage percolation or things like that. But you need smooth functions for, to, to get at least some bounds on these Fourier coefficients. Um, and you know, any bound is, is okay, because you don't have to go very far. Okay? Any crude bound is okay. So this improves this n bound that is given by the Poincare inequality, so it proves super concentration. To improve to n over log n, to remove this log log n, you, you know, it's in my, in my paper, so it's, it's a different uh, line of attack. I don't know how to remove this log log n by this technique. So, uh, so that's, we'll not discuss. Uh, as I said, often uh, these hypercontractive methods, which I will not discuss, are used to prove super concentration. So it was introduced by Talagrand in this context. Uh, and uh, you know, there's this breakthrough work of Benjamin Nicolai and Schramm and various authors after that. Um, this does not seem to work in spin glasses. Okay, okay so let me now talk about uh, chaos. Okay. So as usual, you have a Markov process xt with Dirichlet form e, semigroup pt, eigenvalues lambda k, eigenfunctions, spectral gap, equilibrium measure, etc. And it's easy to show that the Dirichlet form of f and ptf decays exponentially in time if lambda 1 is positive. If, the, if you have a spectral gap, it decays exponentially in time. So we'll say that a function f is epsilon delta chaotic if for all t bigger than delta, uh, you beat this bound by epsilon. So uh, the Dirichlet form of f and ptf is bounded by epsilon times e to the minus lambda 1 t times uh, eff. Okay. So what does this mean? Okay, it some, seems like something uh, quite abstract. Um, uh, so, but in other words, it just says that if f is epsilon delta chaotic, if for, sm uh, for small, you know, if you have it for small epsilon and delta, then this decays to zero much faster than what you'd expect from this bound. Okay, much faster than you know usual functions which which decay like this. Okay, you go a little bit away, and it, it's it's very small. So, so I'll, I'll demonstrate with examples why this may be called chaos. Okay, so we'll, we'll see in two examples why, uh, why I'm calling this chaos. Okay, is, is the definition clear? Okay, um, so recall the free energy of the, of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. This is this written out explicitly, so you have this free energy. And the relevant semigroup for studying this is the n choose two-dimensional onstein ullenbeck semigroup PT, which has spectral gap one. And now you let all these values flow as onstein ullenbeck processes. So each gij flows like an onstein ullenbeck process. So let gij t be an onstein ullenbeck process, with gij zero being gij. So you let all these values gradually evolve as onstein ullenbeck process. And there, these will be stationary because you're starting with Gaussian. So just like this, uh, this collection at any time t will define a Gibbs measure at inverse temperature beta. So you fix your inverse temperature. Uh, we'll call this the Gibbs measure at time t. Okay. <clears throat> so you let the GIJs flow over time. The Gibbs measure also evolves over time. And if t is close to zero, then uh, then GIJ t is close to GIJ zero. So in a small time, it doesn't move very far. Okay, so is this, is this okay? What I'm calling the 
Gibbs measure at time t. So you have this GIJs which define a Gibbs measure at time zero. And with these, each of these variables, you're letting it flow as an Ornstein-Ullenbeck process, okay? So you're starting at time zero and you're letting it flow. So the Gibbs measure changes over time. So at each time t, you have a new Gibbs measure. Okay, so fix t and beta. Let sigma one be a configuration drawn from the Gibbs measure at time zero. Sigma two be a configuration from the Gibbs measure at time t. Let r1 to t be the overlap between these two configurations. And you can compute to show that this quantity that you are looking at, uh, the Dirichlet form of fn and ptfn, and multiplied by e to the t, that's just the expected value of the overlap squared, okay? So that's what it comes out to be. So in a nutshell, what this means is that if the free energy is epsilon delta chaotic, it exactly means that for all t bigger than delta, the expected overlap squared between two configurations at time zero and time t uh, is bounded by epsilon. So, so it means that in a small time, the Gibbs measures become such that you, know, you pick two con configurations from the two Gibbs measures, they're almost orthogonal. So the Gibbs measure changes drastically within a little bit of time. You, you let the GI just flow for a little bit, the Gibbs measure changes drastically, okay? So in this context, so, so you see, you know, the strange definition of chaos that I gave, um, it gives, gives rise to a natural phenomenon. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, similarly, let's, let's just do one more example on a slide. Um, so you have the integer lattice Z2, and on each edge, you have a Gaussian random variable. Call these the edge weights. So these may be positive or negative, of course. Um, so take any n and consider the set of all upright paths from 0, 0 to n, n. So paths that move only to the right or to up, okay? The weight of a path is defined as the sum of edge weights along the path. So there are two n edges along the path, and you sum up the edge weights, and that's the weight of a path. Let ln be the weight of the heaviest path from 0, 0 to nn. So this is the problem of oriented last passage percolation. So on each edge, you have a Gaussian, Gaussian random variable, and you consider all upright paths from 0, 0 to nn. And, um, you know, so, so let ln be the weight of the heaviest path heaviest upright path from, uh, uh, from 0, 0 to nn. So now you let the weights evolve, okay? So what you do is you take, again, as before, you take each um, edge and you do an ornstein uhlenbeck process on that edge. You start with the edge weight and you let it evolve according to an ornstein uhlenbeck process, okay? So let g e t, t bigger than zero, Okay, for each edge it's an Ornstein-Lindbeck process, so the collectivity it's an infinite dimensional Ornstein-Lindbeck process. And for each time t, you have a set of edge weights, so you have an optimal path, okay? So let pt be the optimal path, the path of heaviest weight at time t, okay? Okay, so, so, so again, you have this model, you have these edge, edge weights, and you have this, um, uh, these paths, and you have the weights of the paths, and you have an optimal path, the path that has a maximum weight. And as time evolves, the weights change, okay? The weights evolve, and the optimal path also changes as time evolves. Now the weights change continuously, but the optimal path may change discreetly. Of course, has to change discreetly. Again, an easy computation will tell you that this thing that we are looking at is exactly the expected value of the number of edges in the intersections of the two paths at time zero and at time t, okay? So this strange thing that, uh, that I wrote down becomes something quite natural. It's the, it's the expected value of the intersection, of the size of the intersection. So you have two paths, both of length 2n, because you know, all paths are upright paths, so 0, 0 to n, n must have 2n edges. So there are 2n edges, and this is the intersection of the the number of edges in the intersection of the two paths. And what epsilon delta chaotic means, if ln is epsilon delta chaotic, then it just means that for all t bigger than delta, so if you just go a little bit in time, 
the expected value of the number of edges in intersection of the two paths is bounded by epsilon n. So it's a, it has a very small intersection. So chaos, if, if one can show, and it has been proved actually, if one can show chaos, uh, chaos of ln, it just means, uh, you know, according to the sense that I defined, it just means that if you let the system evolve for a little bit of time, then the two paths, the optimal paths that you get become almost disjoint. You know, the, the, the intersection divided by n goes to zero. Yes? Oh, uh, PT is, okay, so, so you have all these edge weights, which are Gaussian random variables, and each of them is evolving according to an Orsch-Tulenbeck process. So ln is a function of all these edge weights. So PT ln is in that sense. So it's the expected value of ln at time t, uh, given that you have a certain configuration at time zero. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so, so the, chaos the chaos that we saw for, uh, for the sherrington kirkpatrick model, that is, if you change the dis disorder a little bit, you change the GIGs a little bit, the, the configurations that you draw from the two Gibbs measures become almost orthogonal. Or in this case, if you change the edge weights a little bit, the optimal paths become almost disjoint. So th this all fits into this definition of chaos that I gave you. And the main theorem is this, okay? So it's not exactly written in this form here, but it's essentially this if chaos and super concentration are the same. That is, if F is epsilon delta chaotic, then it's epsilon prime super concentrated, where epsilon prime is epsilon plus lambda one delta. So if the, both of these are small, then epsilon prime is also very small. Conversely, if F is epsilon super concentrated, then for any delta, F is epsilon prime delta chaotic, where epsilon prime is this, okay? So if F is epsilon super concentrated for some small epsilon, then choosing de you choose delta to be square root epsilon, so you get epsilon prime to be this. So both of these are small. So, so you know, in, in this paper in 2008, uh, everything is stated in limiting form as n goes to infinity. Um, but you can you know, easily write down quantitative things, so why should one put down limit, limit forms? Um, so it just says that if, if a function is super concentrated, then it's chaotic, and if it's chaotic, then it's super concentrated. And therefore, one consequence is in the last passage percolation problem, if one can prove that the last passage time ln is super concentrated, and that has been proven. So just improving the classical bound a little bit will imply that it's chaotic. That is, if you change the environment a little bit, then the two paths become almost disjoint, okay? So it's all, you know, a very simple sequence of steps that you have. Um, okay, any questions? Okay. So, so you see what, what you have shown. Um, uh, okay, so I'll write down later, later on that, um, you know, essentially in the sherrington kirkpatrick model, if you change the, 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 the GIGs a little bit, then the two configurations that you draw from the two Gibbs measures will be, uh, with high probability, they'll be almost orthogonal. Because we have proved super concentration already using the Fourier expansions. We have proved that the free energy uh, has smaller variance than, um, than, cl than the classical theory gives. Okay, uh, the sketch of the proof of this equivalence of super concentration and chaos. Again, it's, it's extremely simple. Um, so, so PT is e to the TL. So the spectral decomposition of L gives you that the Dirichlet form of F with PTF is just this. Summation lambda k e to the minus lambda k t u k f squared. Okay, if you're not convinced, you can verify. Uh, this is a very simple expression that you have in the spectral decomposition. Okay. Now the Planchard identity tells you that the variance of F is just the summation of u k f squared. But you can get it from here. You just integrate over t. If you integrate t from zero to infinity, this becomes one for each k. Therefore, it's just the integral zero to infinity of the Dirichlet form of f and ptf. Now, so if this decays to zero unusually rapidly, if it decays to zero very fast, then variance of f must be very small, okay? On the other hand, from this formula, we see that this is the decreasing non-negative function of t. So this is first of all non-negative, 
And secondly, it's decreasing function of T. Now, if, you know, if, if this side is very small, unusually small, so you have the integral of a non-negative decreasing function, which is unusually small, it means that the function must drop to zero rapidly. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's equivalence of super concentration and chaos from, just from this formula. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is that this quantity that you have here contains information about the structure of the system. So in last passage percolation, for instance, uh, last passage percolation time is just a time, you know, the heaviest weight. But this thing says something about the structure of the system. It says the, the expected intersection of two paths at time zero and time t. Okay, so this formula somehow connects, you know, values associated with the system with the structure of the system. Okay, so any questions about this proof? So, you know, it's easy to fill in the details. So I, I you know, I could have given the full details, but it's better to give the idea, yes. No, you need to do a little bit of computation. So, you know, for Gaussian variables, E, F, G is integral expected value of gradient F dot gradient G. Okay, that we discussed, that integral. Uh, now, uh, if F is the last passage time, then the gradient of F, you know, the derivative of the last passage time with, a vertex, with an edge weight, with respect to an edge weight, is just the indicator that the edge weight belongs to the optimal path. So when you take the inner product, okay, so that's how you get, okay, maybe I should have shown that. Okay, so again, I, I didn't want to go into any computation, so I, that's why I didn't show, but you know, you can, you can verify that uh, it, none, none of the computations that I have skipped are, are terrible. I mean, it's, it's very, everything is very simple. Okay, any other questions? So you see, this, this part is a, is a little, you know, is, is a little nicer than this one. This one is very easy. If you have chaos, then you have super concentration because this goes to zero rapidly, therefore the integral is small. The other part you need that it's uh, non-negative and decreasing. So th to deduce that if this is small, then this should go to zero fast. Okay. Okay, so here is chaos in the SK model. Um, let R1 to T be the overlap between a configuration drawn at time zero and another drawn at time T. So you have the GIG is evolving over time and you draw two configurations at time zero and time T and you take the normalized linear product. Then whenever T is bigger than square root one over log N, you have that the expected overlap squared is bounded by square root one over log N, okay? And this is known as chaos and disorder. This was an open problem for, for a long time. Uh, and there is something else known as chaos in temperature, which is still open, okay? And uh, there is recent, more recent progress by Chen and Panchenko, and uh, we proved, uh, you know, if you add an uh, additional, you know, external field, then it, you still have chaos, which is a much harder theorem than what I proved here. And this, uh, actually, I should mention that it gives a slightly better bound. It gives all moment bounds and so on. So, and the technique is different than what I showed here. Okay. And you have a similar theorem for last passage percolation and various other, other models. Okay, now let me now sketch in one slide why chaos will imply multiple values. Okay, so this takes a bit of time to write down completely rigorously and prove, but I can give you the idea in one slide. So I'll, I'll give you the idea. And you know, the idea is to the extent that you can fill out the steps. The Gibbs measure at inverse temperature beta concentrates on near minimum, minimal energy states if beta is large. So if you have a Gibbs measure and you take a large beta, then the states that you pick from the measure are almost you know, near minimal, minimal energy, okay? That's the first thing. Let H T sigma denote the energy of sigma at time t, okay? So you're letting this ornstein uhlenbeck flow go on, and at time t, the at each time t, sigma has some energy. So ht sigma be the energy at time t. Now fix a large beta. Suppose sigma one and sigma two are picked from the Gibbs measures at time zero and time t. Then h sigma one and ht sigma two are close to the minimum of the two energies. Okay. Because beta is large. 
because beta is large, h sigma one is close to minimum h sigma, and h, h t sigma two is close to minimum h t sigma. Okay. Okay. So beta large meaning depending on n, you are growing, you are letting beta grow. But if t is small, okay, if t is small, then h t sigma is close to h sigma because you're not perturbing a lot. So in particular, the minimum is close to the minimum at time zero. So if the main observation, if beta is large and t is small, then the sigma two is a near minimal energy state for h also, not only for h t. Okay, so you see, uh, you are you have your Gibbs measure at time um, zero and at time t, you are picking two configurations from the two measures, and if your beta is large and t is small, then this sigma two that you pick is near minimal energy for you know for this original Gibbs measure also. It's a little. Confusing, but if you look at it, you'll you'll see. Questions? Is it, yes. Is it obvious that I mean I I can see why for given configuration uh, H doesn't change much, but the minimum could, could in principle. Oh no, that's because you get you get a uniform bound over all sigma. You bound, you yeah, you can get a uniform bound. Now, if beta is large and t is small. And they're calibrated so that this continues to be small. So you know that the expected R1 to t squared is small for uh, small t. Now, it may grow if beta is large, but you don't allow beta to go, grow very large. So you calibrate them. You choose beta large and t small depending on n. But you calibrate them, them so that this is still small. Then you have found two nearly orthogonal states, sigma 1 and sigma 2, which are both near minimal energy at time 0. <coughs> Okay, so you have found two states, okay, which are nearly orthogonal to each other, and which are both near minim minimum energy. So you, we use chaos, we use the property of chaos to find two states that are near minimal energy and nearly orthogonal. That's the, that's the upshot of the whole thing. And now, you know, we, get, we repeat and we get many such states, okay. So that's the, that's the idea of how to prove multiple values. So you have this chaos property. So you can, you know, it's not hard to visualize what, what's happening. So you have this, um, you know, instead of multiple values, you think of them as, you know, multiple peaks maybe. So you have these mountains where you have these peaks, okay? Now, uh, you, you, a priori you don't know it has many peaks which are all nearly the same height, okay? But you see that you perturb the system a little bit, then the highest point jumps to some distant point. Now, since the perturbation was very small, this distant point was already near min maximal to start with. Otherwise, it, it could not have jumped to that distant point. Okay? So this shows that there are many points which are, which are nearly maximum. Okay? So this proves uh, this multiple valley theorem for the SK model. And uh, the same idea goes through in, uh, in many other examples. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Does it, does it work the same in last passage percolation? Uh, yes. So it, it works exactly the same in last passage percolation. So um, so you start with you know the, the sketch of the thing is as follows. You start with your last passage percolation time. The variance is bounded by n. That's the classical bound. Um, then you improve it to n over log n using hypercontractive methods. You, from that you conclude that. Um, you know, you let the environment flow according to Norsten-Lindbeck flow, then within a short amount of time you get that the expected overlap between two paths is, is very small, okay? And that, combined with this argument, will tell you that there are many paths which are near, uh, nearly maximal, and they're all, all disjoint, almost. You, use that, you just show that you have chaos for the minimal time, for the, sorry, for L, for the maximal time as well. Yeah. Where you write No, 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 this, this, this holds. So, so chaos of Ln doesn't mean that the value of Ln is, is chaotic. It's, it's, a, it's a definition. It, it, you, know, you, you boil it down to, you, know, you, you work it out and you see what it means. It just means that the path, the optimal path is chaotic. That's what it means. 
Okay. Any other questions? Okay, uh, there are two research problems. Okay, yes. Oh, uh, that's a you know s sort of a natural um, thing associated with the Gaussian measure. So that's a natural invariant, uh, you know, natural process for which the Gaussian measure is invariant. But you can work with other processes also. You can, you know, in particular, this whole thing is um, so. For instance, you can do uh, each edge is replaced by an independent copy after an exponential time. So that that process. So uh, you know, there's a Poisson clock on each edge, and you. Uh, you replace it by an independent edge, so that's the usual noise sensitivity uh, thing. So this whole uh, argument goes through because, uh, as, as I wrote down, I mean none of the theorems are specific uh, to this Ornstein-Uhlenbeck process. I, I dealt with general semigroups and general, uh, you know, um, Markov processes and so on. So, so it's not uh, it's not specific to the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck process. The only purpose is um, is that I wanted to stick to a single example uh, throughout the talk. So that uh, you know, not to encumber you with uh, too many, too many things. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so some research problems. Um, rigorously compute the optimal order of variance in super concentrated quantities. So in almost all problems. Uh, so there are some few, uh, you know, exactly solvable ones. The largest eigenvalue of uh, of certain matrix ensembles, and you know, the longest increasing subsequence, and uh, you know, random permutation, and so on. Except for a few exactly solvable questions, we don't really know how to get close to the optimal order. We can only get log n improvements, but we don't know how to, you know, get even power improvements. Uh, so, for instance, in the Shannon Kirkpatrick model, the free energy, can you prove something something better than n over log n? Okay, or in first passage percolation, or in last passage percolation, all these problems. And uh, you know, more close to this uh, this talk is uh, we have this definition of multiple valleys. So I think there must be a definition which is equivalent to chaos and super concentration instead of being weaker. So in multiple valleys right now, I have a very simplistic definition which is weaker. So chaos and super concentration implies multiple valleys, but uh, the implication doesn't go the other way. Um, so, is there, a, is there a definition which is um, which is equivalent? Okay. Okay. So, uh, I have a feeling that I kind of may have rushed through the slides because uh, I prepared one and a half times the slides that that I that I had uh, last time, but I finished early. So, so we we have ended. But uh, you know, um, if you have questions, you may. Yes. Is uh, log n the same as in the KKL theorem? Uh, it, is, it is the same as in the KKL theorem. So this log n improvements that people get um, are using, so Talagran, when he, when he first uh, you know, gave, gave, the, gave this variance bound, I think he didn't know about the KKL paper. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's basically the same idea. Um, now. It was used by Benjamin Kalai and Schramm in the, uh, to prove uh, the bound for last pass first passage percolation improvement bound, improved bound, but um, uh, it required a new new idea beyond the KKL idea. So it required something, some new input. Um, now in spin glasses, somehow this hypercontractive thing doesn't work. So you, you know, I was trying for a long time how how to get to get the bound. And, you know. It just it just doesn't seem to work somehow. So um, so I had a more much more complicated proof before uh, without using hypercontractivity, and this one is much simpler. So somehow with this extra log log n, okay, you have to pay that price. But with this log log n, uh, you can you can get the simple uh, simple bound that that I showed you using just you know the, this improved Poincaré inequality and nothing else. <coughs> 